we found out probably midnight Thursday night that we'd definitely bagged the number one. So, but we found ourselves yeah. in a premier inn on an A road outside Preston. Right, um, right. Exactly. And we only arrived at that at about midnight. So we went for a really lovely meal, very civilized. And then it all went a bit wrong. Um, <laughs> and, and I was a bit <laughs> concerned on Sunday when I woke up because I couldn't find that trophy anywhere. It took me a while to find it. <laughs> Welcome. We are Neil, Luke and Dave. Three forty somethings reminiscing on the runners and riders of nineties guitar music. We look at the bands who soundtracked our youth on both sides of the pond and interview some of our heroes from the bands that defined a generation. You'll hear about the good, the bad and the ugly of nineties guitar music. This podcast is stupid and contagious. Episode 24 of the Stupid and Contagious podcast. It's a big one. Managed to get hold of Rick Witter this week, didn't we? Uh, so if this is your first time uh, tuning in, if you're uh, downloaded or watching, especially to see um, Rick, subscribe to the podcast, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've had some good guests on, um, for example. Well, we've had uh, Ben Harding from uh, Census Things on. We've had Jerry from Mega City 4 Roddy Bottom from Faith No More, uh, Ian Baker from Jesus Jones, uh, Louis from Rialto, Jeremy Cunningham, Terry Christian, we spoke to the legend that is Terry Christian from The Word. We've had some good guests so far and we've got loads more coming up. So yeah, if, if 90s guitar music is your vibe, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> you found us. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we got a really cool Facebook group. It's really friendly and a good place to hang out. So go and join that. How is everyone, you fuckers? Dave, got your jerking on? Still cold over there? Oh, yeah, I thought you took your jerking off last week. No, it's chilly in the house. Looks like your jerking's been ravaged by some rats. <laughs> yeah, Alex. what's going on, man? <laughs> it's just uh, 10 years old. It's just acid dripping off my face, like... <laughs> Destroying the uh, collar. Acid. Yeah, we <laughs> all have acid good, in man. our skin, you know. Oh, LSD, wicked. Acid. It looks like it's like um, been torn in battle. It's like a Dungeons and Dragons kind of jerking, isn't it? It looks like you've been battling some dragons and shit. Enough of this nonsense. We've got to be a professional podcast. This is supposed to be the one where we're sensible and and mainstream and shit. Come on. Yeah, let's just get into the this week's... Um, episode so we contacted rick i think the album had come out but it hadn't gone to number one he only had 20 minutes for this one because obviously he's a very very busy man this week so it's not like our longer interviews usually our interviews are about sort of an hour long but this one was a bit shorter nevertheless we got some good stuff in um luke tell us a little bit about shed seven um all right uh well with apologies in advance for any mistakes so if there's any shed heads listening that are super shed, is experts? That a thing? Is that a thing? <sighs> Apparently so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shed I mean, what else head. are they going to be called? I like, right? I like that. I'm a bit of a shed head myself. Oh, yeah? Shed head. Yeah, it's one of my, one of my <laughs> favourite bands. <laughs> is that true? Since when? Since 1996. Okay, okay. Yeah. There you go. Didn't know that. Shed head. Shedhead, Dave the Shedhead. What do you reckon, um, category wise? I guess ER. indie. Yeah, ER. I'll go on. I've got uh, Dave Simpson of Melody Makers uh, mm. blurb. Shed Seven's beautiful, beautifully posed, epic music is different. Not so much new wave of new wave as post Smiths. They're taking the insular bed sit angst of Morrissey's early music and subverting it with a brash, insensitive sexual narcissism. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> shit, that was shit. That is narcissism <laughs> word salad. That's nonsense. <laughs> What's the last part again? Say the last part again. Insensitive sexual narcissism. What does that mean? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Fucking Dave Simpson's got a lot to answer for. These people get paid to write that shit, man. By the word, by the sound of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Just you know, work. he talked about the Smiths in the, in the interview. I won't give it away, but he talked a little bit about yeah. the Smiths. And I've, I've seen a couple of other articles mention like um, I've, I don't I don't hear it myself. I don't I hear don't any Smiths in, in their sound at all. I think they might have just picked up on the fact he might have mentioned that he liked and, and then they ran with it. But yeah, I don't, right. I don't really right. see that. What would, what, would sensitive, what would sensitive sexual narcissism be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand any of it. What's insular bed, bed sit angst? I mean, I can kind of understand that, but it, insen- I'm trying to get my head around insensitive sexual narcissism. Dave, are your headphones? Are they not working? Run out, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good advert for those. Oh, yeah. We were advertising them last week. Open run shocks. Open run shocks. <laughs> Don't Shit. last more than five minutes. Ten minutes plus two power. <laughs> Well, I just called them indie or Britpop, basically. Um, started in 1990 uh, in York, had a few kind of early lineup changes and stuff, and they signed to Polydor in uh, 1993. <sighs> Ridiculously successful, right? Uh, 15 top 40 singles. That's nuts, right? Uh, it's insane. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, And that was by that 99, is... right? The 15. Yeah, this is all singles. in the 90s, yeah. Yeah, and four four top ten albums in there in the nineties as well. They're always caught up on the fringes, though, weren't they? We talked about it in the interview, but they were. You know. We didn't get to talk about it um, enough. But they, I, that that Dave Simpson, whatever he is, a description about kind of the, the the epicness. I think that's in there, which I think is good. I, I kind of wanted to talk about it in the interview, but I did, we didn't get a chance. But I think I saw Shed Seven as like a bit of a reaction against the kind of the shoegazy kind of. Sh- Foot shuffling or the angsty kind of over earnestness of grunge. They were kind of bright and brash and not afraid mm. to, you know, write a, a heartfelt, uplifting in, in the epic ballad, you know. And I think I see them a bit of a reaction against that kind of, I don't know, shoegazy stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I just remember really liking them. Uh, I just thought they had quite a fresh sort of sound. I'm not going to say I had a <laughs> unique vocal. <laughs> Good. <I didn't. laughs> Come on, Neil. Admit he did. He did, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I just thought they were really good. The, the sound I hear the most is is uh, the Rolling Stones. I mean, he, he, he memorably they did Jumping Jack Flash on TFI Friday, but that's the kind of the, right. the sound I, I pick up on more. Anyway, but, um, so first album, Change Giver, nineteen ninety four, reached number sixteen in the UK charts. I thought it was called Change Geyser for ages. <laughs> What's that like? No Geyser. What, I, what does I it mean? Know I don't know, I just misread it. What's the Geyser? <laughs> I don't know. I thought I thought it was something cool. <laughs> right. I don't know that reminds me of misreading um <laughs> the you know, the album by In Excess, Mystify. <laughs> my stiffy sure, my stiffy I read it like that <laughs> so you fucking did you dirty bastard well he was wasn't he he was it's yeah. pretty much what that album is about right he's a sexual deviant hey man no kink shaming you know whatever you're into <laughs> genuinely thought it was changed guy though for ages <laughs> it doesn't mean anything though my <laughs> stiffy has a meaning changed guy though, doesn't there might have been like a philo- 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 philosophical Meaning behind it or something. Um, it spawned the hit Speakeasy and uh, Ocean Pie. I think Dolphin was a hit off that as well, Build, building up momentum. Second album, um, it's kind of the big one, uh, Maximum High, came out in 1996, reached number eight uh, in the charts. Uh, I love that album. Spawned yeah. the hits, Getting Better, Where Have You Been Tonight, my favourite, Going For Gold, Bully Boy, Parallel Lines, just hit after hit after hit, right? Crazy. Amazing it, right? album. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were all over uni by then. Well, involved. I talk about it in, in the interview, but yeah, I think the very first day I, I arrived at university, I was wearing my Shed 7 skinny rib football you replica shirt. Well, you, you little <laughs> shit. Well, I think I was. I think I was. <laughs> Start as you mean to go on, I guess. That's it, man. That's it. If you're going to yeah. be the, the archetypal indie kid, then you might as well start off as one. Um, Let It Ride, third album, came out in 1998, got to number nine in the charts as well so still you know putting out hits and uh and everything and that was kind of the first kind of initial um phase um but with again we kind of touch on it in interview without giving too much away so they they basically sold shit loads of records right yeah. um and they were a huge band but they never really got it couldn't get no respect you know for some reason 
Well, we we talked about it in the interview, but yeah, how they were like the champions. They were always in a championship league of Britpop. And they never got an enemy cover, unbelievably. Is that true? Mm, apparently so. I've seen it. I, I saw it on, on Wikipedia and I cross-referenced it with a couple of other articles that might think, I guess they might be repeating Wikipedia, but as far as I can tell, it's true, yeah. But generally, I think... they have respect from just ordinary... I mean, I was yeah. a student. We respected yeah. them. It must have yeah. just been a weird uh, journalism circle thing. So. Yeah, and the yeah. hipsters in that there London trying to be cool, yeah. But I think, like, Rick was seen as, like, the ultimate kind of skinny, like, skinny indie kid, right? He was, like, the poster boy for the, the skinny indie indie boy. I, I think I'm sure I read at the time that Rick Witter had a 26-inch waist. Same as you, isn't it? 26 is, is, is thin, isn't it? What's yours now? Fuck off. I'm not, I'm not revealing my um, private information on a, on a public forum. No one What's your give a waist shit. size, motherfucker? I think he's about a 32 these days. Yeah, I'm, t- I'm still trying to squeeze into my 32 inch jeans. You're probably about an 18. I'm about, I'm about 30. Yeah. I, well, these ones I've got on today, they're 29, I think, but they're, but they're French. So. Oh, hey, ho, hey, ho. I'm going to move on. Can you do that? No. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. Well, I'm leaving it in. And also, I, I said on a post, I did, I did a post uh, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago on, on the Facebook page. For some reason, at university, there was this group of lads, these posh kids, and they, 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 they gave me the nickname Shed7. And I don't really know why. It could be because you were wearing that T-shirt on the first day at uni. Yeah, but I didn't meet that. them on the first day. I guess they must have seen me in the T-shirt. I guess, I guess. There's no yeah. way that you didn't just wear that T-shirt on the first day, is there? No, of course, of course. I, I, wore, like it. I, I wore it the whole way... <laughs> I wore it the whole way through my three years at university, yeah. But well, then it's not such a mystery, is it? I just thought oh, I it guess. would be known. <laughs> so just like my football shirt, that's in the, like, the local team. So basically they had loads of label trouble. Um, talks about it in interviews, so I won't go into it. They ended up leaving Polydor in uh, 1999. They tried other, another couple of kind of smaller record labels that were just as much... Um, trouble, and they ended up basically breaking up in 2003. Um, they did release another album before that, uh, Truth Be Told, in 2001, but it didn't it, it didn't even make the top 40, just outside the top 40, uh, basically. They didn't uh, split up for long, though, did they? 2007, they were back at it, weren't they? They were, but they that was just kind of doing kind of sporadic Greatest touring. Hits. They didn't... Yeah, they didn't actually release... Uh, a new album till 2017, so ten years after that. Mm. So uh, that was instant pleasures um, until until this new album, their highest chart in non compilation album, that came in uh, number eight. I mean, that's that's a brave move in itself, isn't it? To sort of release something new, I think. Yeah, although Rick did do, do some kind of soloy stuff in between Rick Witter and the Dukes, he had a band, and that brings us up to date. So their sixth album, a uh, matter of time. Well, until. Last week was uh, the UK's number one album, and they uh, got a new chart record of being the longest, I think for, for a rock record, the longest um, gap between debut album and hitting number one, which is uh, pretty impressive. Dave, uh, how, how come you're a Shed 7 fan? Tell us, tell us about your Shed Head days. Come on, Shed Head. I just like their songs better than a lot of the other bands around at the time. Thanks. <laughs> I was going to say I saw them at Cardiff Uni, but I don't think I went. <laughs> but they were. They played at our uh, ball. University. That's good enough, though. That's, oh, that's close enough, good. isn't it? You might as well oh, say you've seen them. Very good. What, like a Leavers ball. Yeah. And we had Paul Oakenfold, which was fucking nuts. It was in a wow. tiny, like little courtyard. We had Paul Oakenfold. I don't think I went to a Leavers ball. Hmm. Is that a thing? Yes. When you leave, you have a ball. Maybe you didn't get invited. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> probably more like it. But apparently. The concert I didn't see at our uni. A friend of mine wanted to ask, wanted you to ask him. But it was too late. If he remembers pissing in the our uni bar, Rick, Rick did. Yeah, apparently so. Not in the toilet, just in the bar, just where everyone was, where he, where he was standing. Wait, 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 wait. Rick, Rick Witter pissed in Cardiff University bar. Yeah, that's what. That's the well, rumor. I shouldn't just say yeah. We. Yeah. My friend thought he did. Yeah. I wanted to ask if he remembers doing it. But it's a bit libelous if he didn't. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Rick, if you're listening, 
confirm or deny. Yeah, so we're giving we're giving Rick the right to reply, and it, until proven otherwise, it did not happen. Wasn't there another one, Dave? You said there was another one. My friend Vic wanted to us to talk about snooker because apparently he's a big snooker fan. Oh, um, yeah, we didn't. We had we, like I said, we only had twenty minutes. I prepared for the normal like long interview, so when he said he only had twenty minutes, I was, I was a bit flustered. So as you can probably tell, when we watch it in a moment. I did panic a little bit. Still did a good job. Still did a good job. Yeah, it's really good. It's a good interview. We usually just sit and chat for an hour, don't we? But it it was just questions, really. But it was still good, you know. Yeah, it's it's great to meet him. And he's a lovely bloke, so. So should we have a listen? Here's Rick Witter from chart-topping band Shed 7. Enjoy. (laughs) Rick, thanks so much for coming on. What an amazing week. Uh, record breaking number one album yeah incredible isn't it really I mean I think we are the kind of with a buzzword now for perseverance and never giving yeah. up I guess aren't we yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean does it feel like a kind of validation no not really because we didn't approach this any differently to how we've ever done anything we've, we've obviously just I think the stars have aligned and it's our time you know I mean God knows what will happen in the future but we'll persist on doing what we've always done we won't change the way we are you know I think I think we've just hit some type of period of time where people have got it you know I mean we've we've, we've always sold a lot of records but I mean, even in the 90s, for example, Chasing Rainbows, when we released that as a single, if we'd released it on a different week, it would have gone to number one. It's just because it was such a busy week in the charts, it went in at whatever it did, number 13 or something ridiculous. So, you know, there's lots of behind the scenes stuff that people don't really see. But I think I think this is the build up for maybe the last 10 years, this moment. You know, we've, we've put an awful lot of hard work into it grounding out our fan base trying to make ourselves appear bigger playing loads of gigs and upping the ante in that respect you know instant pleasures was an accidental album really we didn't plan on it but after 16 years of no music to come up with that we were quite proud of at the time um so it freed us up now we had done the kind of difficult ages after comeback album so this was a bit of fresh air for us so it was a pleasure yeah. writing it. It took it literally took us about nine months to write it, which is a nerd off for us as well. Every, everything about it just seemed to work. So we kind of we kind of clung onto those horns of that wild beast and just rode with it and we've not been thrown off as yet. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um so how's this week been? If you've been I see you've been out playing record shops and uh, stuff like that. It seems pretty mad. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously we wanted to do old school promote. So we've been in two cities a day, up and down the motorway, performing acoustic songs in record stores, meeting the lovely public, signing people's stuff. But so we finished that on Sunday in Glasgow, uh, after knowing we'd got the number one, mm-hmm. and then we travelled back from Glasgow on the Sunday in a minibus. So I suddenly started shivering and shaking. Uh, and picked up some horrible lurgy. So literally for the past two days, well, Monday, Tuesday, I was just bed bound. I couldn't get up. So that was a fine oh, way man. to start celebrating a number one record. I've not actually yeah. really been out of the house. So um, uh, the only person who's properly congratulated me in real life is my wife and the postman. <laughs> in what order? <laughs> well, I didn't wake up next to the postman. So you, you do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'm gonna i've been doing an awful lot of these interviews over the past few days discussing stuff it's been amazing it's been really good the love for us at the minute brilliant but i will enjoy um perhaps going out and meeting some friends and having a few drinks at some point uh the only yeah, thing is we've got we've got three big gigs coming up not this weekend but next weekend we've put them on sale advertised as playing the album in its entirety, but the six of the buggers that we've never played in a room together yet. So <laughs> Monday and Tuesday next week is going to be a quite an intense rehearsal time. And then, <laughs> you better practice that. <laughs> are you, uh, so, you going to yeah. bring their special guest along with you? Um, uh, well, I nearly really lost it in mm. Glasgow. Do you mean the trophy? No, no, no. I mean, the, the special guests that play on the album. We've got uh, Pete Doherty and Rowetta oh, and see, Laura sorry. McClure. Yes. Are they going to be um, going on tour? 
Um, not we're just doing these three one-offs. Uh, I don't think there's any plans for that, those three guys to come to these three gigs. But I mean, it opens it up for the future in so many ways for us. So Rowetta came and guested in Manchester when we did that in October last year, and that was amazing. Um, I think whenever we play anywhere near Manchester, if Rowetta is there, she'll come. Um, Pete Docherty lives in France, so I mean. Again, it would have to be planned and pre-arranged for that. But however, he is supporting us in yeah. the Museum Gardens next July in York. Oh, so we'll, we'll nice. fingers crossed because he's there in the in the same field as us. He'll come back out and sing throwaways with us, hopefully. Brilliant. Yeah, but Brilliant. tell us the story. Tell us the story you're about to tell us about the. Uh, is it the trophy that you're talking about? Yeah, well, because we found out, we found out probably midnight Thursday night that we'd definitely bagged the number one. So, but we found ourselves yeah. in a Premier Inn on an A road outside Preston. Right, um, right. Exactly. And we only arrived at that at about midnight. So, and then we had to get up dead early on Friday to drive to Saturday to drive to Glasgow. So it was just a weird period of time. But then when we had done the afternoon in Glasgow and got that out of the way and, and we had the evening free. So we went for a really lovely meal, very civilized. And then it all went a bit wrong, um, <laughs> and and I was a bit concerned on Sunday when I woke up because I couldn't find that trophy anywhere. It took me a while to find it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so thankfully it's at home with me now. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back on kind of the distance of whatever thirty years, what's your take on like the Britpop scene from from your vantage point of now? Well, I mean, I'm asked a lot. What, what what do you remember of the 90s? And it's not a lot, to be honest. I mean, and I say that because obviously there was a lot of partying going on, but also there was a lot, an awful lot of hard work. And yeah. it was such an intense period of time. Obviously, it was an amazing time. I mean, I remember being a young kid loving independent music, but it was independent in the sense that you really had to search for it to find like, it. Like who? Uh, who, were you, who were you into? Then? Well, I, I really liked... I mean, uh, at school, towards the tail end of the Smiths, I was really into them, but I'm talking when I was about 15. They were about to release the last album, I think, and there was literally three or four of us in our school year that liked the Smiths. Everyone else was into Madonna and, and whatnot. So we were the weirdos of the year because we liked that weird band. But that kind of turned me onto it even more. And then I remember loving very early Soup Dragons. So before before they went all baggy and did, did I'm free and what made them really famous there's there's an album by the soup dragons called this is our art which is a brilliant album which I still go and listen to now on a regular basis to the point where I had their logo painted onto my denim jacket at school um nice. so so I, I liked indie music because I felt like I was the only fan of that band it was special to me you know and then you fast forward slightly and Britpop happens and suddenly indie music is mainstream it's everywhere yeah, yeah. so so you know so all this success we might have been having we didn't really get to stop at any point and and appreciate what was happening because yes you'd release a, a record it'd go in the charts you'd go on top of the pops but then you're told well where's the b-side for that next single that you've got coming up and where you've got to get to spain and do this you've got to go there so there's never really any time it was only really mid noughties really that i even stopped and thought well that happened 10 years ago mm -hmm. just quite strange really my dad yeah. always used to say to me my dad always used to say you've got to stop and smell the roses and it's nice because on this album now, my dad died in 2004. Um, and it's nice because I finally managed to shoe on a few references to my old man in this new album. So uh, yeah, oh, on Let's Go awesome. Dancing, when, on Let's mm. Go Dancing, I'm singing about it's time to stop and smell the roses. That's for my dad. Right. Um, no, dad. And, uh, and on FKH, I think at the end, I sing, um, so let's have another one and then we, we can all go home. That's what my dad always used to say when he used to take us to the pub. He'd get hammered, and I'd be even more drunk than him, but he'd say, let's all have another one, and then we can all go home. <laughs> so there's lo lots of nice little... little That's beautiful, little isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 It's great. That is, that is beautiful. So I've just answered your what was the 90s like by saying I've yeah. been on some references <laughs> to your father in 2024. <laughs> You you talked before about you know there's a lot of love for the band at the moment. Do you think and um, do you think at the time you were seen as kind of less cool than other bands or you, by well, the press definitely. maybe not the fans maybe but by you know 
the press? Oh, definitely so. By other bands, by the press. I mean, not all the press. We had some good reviews, but there was an mm. awful lot of really bad reviews. You know, mm. we'd, we'd have single reviews in the NME and, and the, the reviewer wouldn't even mention the song. They'd just say how bad my hair was or, you know, how uncool <laughs> I looked. Yeah. So, uh, so I always took that with a pinch of salt because they were obviously just being nasty for the sake of being nasty, you know. Because if, oh, yeah. if you're not even if you're not even going to mention the song that you're supposed to be reviewing, then yeah, what's the point? point right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, and then so so many people would love to have that as a job, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that was the bad side of the '90s. The journalists felt that they were just as popular as the acts, you know. And yeah. you don't see that anymore, which is a breath of fresh air. I mean, we it's unusual now that we are getting so much love in the press um, and, and we're being, we're being looked at as an entity rather than something that's just annoying and there, you know, I mean, we were always yeah. championship Britpop, you know, there was premier league Britpop with your ICC blurs and your pulps. Yeah. We were always championship Britpop. Uh, but the, the, the greatest thing, and this again goes with your perseverance and you never giving up and, I mean, I would never give up anyway because it's this is what I do. I couldn't think of doing anything else. So, but the fact that we're still here and there's no enemy really as such anymore. No, you know, most no. most of the bands from that period have all gone. Yeah, it's like yeah. well, you know, we should be there on the school go. curriculum. <laughs> sure. You said other bands as well, not just the press. Were there, were there any? Did you have any beefs with any of the Britpop bands? Well. I mean? Well, I mean, obviously, Oasis, we had our run-ins with them a few times, but then we also had some quite good times with them. So I think mm. it always depended on what they were taking at the time, you know. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I was never really a big fan. I'm not really a, a big fan of violence, really. So to there went there was a spate of time where there was punch-ups in bars and stuff, and that would get you on the front cover of NME. And it's not for me. You know, I'm not into that kind of no. thing. So... I think a little bit might be as well is the fact we're from York, very unusual, weird, that shouldn't be happening. Um, and we didn't play ball and we didn't move to London when we had the opportunity to, and we didn't get seen in Peter Stringfellow's nightclub stroking his hair. You know, we didn't want yeah, to be yeah. part of any of that. So that kind of pushed us a little bit to one side. And contrary to popular belief, I'm quite a, a shy inward person in crowds of people i'm all right on a stage because i can dictate what's happening around me but you know yeah. so if we're backstage if we're backstage at a festival and there's loads of bands milling around i feel a little bit awkward walking up and trying to join in you know what i mean mm-hmm. which probably which probably gave people the impression that we were a bit aloof but it was never really the case if people came up to us yeah. and said hello they'd be like oh hi you're right and and yeah. that seems that i think the older we've got the more relaxed we've got with stuff and certainly now i mean we've got nothing really to prove anymore yeah, yeah. i'm not i'm not just saying that because of what's just happened i've been meaning that yeah. for the past few years you know we just do what we do and we're good at doing it so either jump on board or just find something else you like really yeah 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 you mentioned coolness um i wanted to ask about the how much input did you have into the the merch i only asked because uh I had a uh, orange and navy skinny rib uh, shed seven replica football shirt, and I think that was a yeah. big part of the Britpop aesthetic, right? And that was like yeah. your merch, which I loved. You yeah. know, I had a shed seven on my chest, so all throughout university, yeah. basically. I mean, how yeah. much input did you have into that? Loads of it, loads, loads, and loads of it. Right. I mean, we we would never release and we would never sell anything that we didn't think was good, you know? So there, there would be times where merch companies or record labels would suggest stuff. And if we thought it was good enough, we'd go with it. But a lot of it, the brainchild is comes from us. So yes, all those football style Brazil yeah, t-shirts. Yeah. Brazil stuff. one, right? Yeah. 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 The Brazil was a classic, wasn't it? Um, right. To the point, And you know, so yeah, all of that, um, I mean, everything about us in that respect, the artwork, everything really comes from us. Um, I mean, this particular album, we, we haven't even got management. We've just done it all ourselves with a very small independent record label. So uh, that is, in itself is a huge achievement. You're on yeah. Cooking Vinyl, is that right? Yes, Cooking Vinyl. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, And it's their first number one for, since 2017. So we're all happy. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. that's good. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, uh, 
so well, we haven't got too much time um, left. You speaking of record labels, it sounds like it back in back in the day, you had a few kind of record label problems. Is that is that kind of why you are kind of more on a more independent these days? Can you talk yeah, a bit well, about that? yeah. Who doesn't have problems with record labels? So you know, we in '93 we were being courted by probably about twelve record labels, some indies, some majors, um, and we felt that we chose the right course for us polydor we're really inter- interested um so we signed a six album deal with polydor um and i, I remember, remember originally we're like 20 years old and we're just imagining having the polydor logo on our record covers yeah. like the classics like the who and the jam sure. and all of this we wanted yeah, to yeah, that yeah. Stuff, you know and and for for the first maybe for the first two albums we had kind of carte blanche we you know we want that as a single we want that as our artwork and all of this and they, they had the funds to back us and stuff so that it was all all right for a while but then i think it was after uh yeah it was after let it ride in 98 that came out and did okay and we had she left me on friday and um Devil in Your Shoes, stuff like that was off that album and we released yeah. that and it was all right, but obviously it wasn't groundbreaking or anything. And, and it becomes a point where MDs of labels are thinking, well, why aren't they selling more? Why aren't you doing this? And it was suggested in 99 that we released a greatest hits package. And mm. we're thinking, well, we've only had three albums. So um, is it too soon in our career to release a greatest hits? But then we were told that by this point we'd had about fifteen top forty singles. So we're thinking, right, okay, well we can pretty impressive. We can hold our, we can hold our heads high with that, and think, right, yeah. okay. So it's not like we're Ricky Martin and we've got one big hit and he's got a greatest yeah, hits yeah, yeah. out with other yeah, shit on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but we were also asked to write two new songs to help promote this greatest hit. So effectively, we're being asked by a label write two hit singles, please now. Which yeah, you know, yeah. that's not that's not how any artist should go about it. You don't write hits; you just write songs, and no. what becomes of them is what becomes of them. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, people but, decide, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we decide as well. You know, if, if you write twenty songs for an album, you write the twenty songs, and then you decide what might become a B side, and what is an album track, and what's a single. Mm-hmm. It becomes pretty obvious, really. So, but anyway, we we came we came up with the goods, and we wrote Disco Down and High Hopes. So we're pleased with ourselves that we've managed to do that. So they both go on the Greatest Hits album. We release Disco Down as a single, and it does really well, uh, and it helps to push the Greatest Hits. And then when it was time to release High Hopes, Polydor turned around and said, right, we think you should re-release Going for Gold as a single and not bother with High Hopes. So we're thinking, well, hold on. Well, then we only released Going for Gold as a single three years ago, and we're already slightly uncomfortable with the greatest hits angle. We've written High Hopes, and which is a great song, yeah. but you'd rather us rip off our fans and make yeah. them buy Going for Gold as a single again just to help you push some albums. Yeah. So we kind of said, no, we don't want to do that. We'd rather release High Hopes. And they said, well, if you don't want to do that, see you later. And that was, yeah. that was when we parted ways with, with Polydor Records. <laughs> there you go. And there you go. Good do you know what? Do you know what? In, interestingly now, High Hopes is a mainstay. It was never a single. It was on a greatest mm. hits album. It was never a single. And it's one of the most loved songs whenever we play that live. There you go. So that goes, yeah. goes to Shows how much the, the, <laughs> they know fuck all yeah. about music. There you go. This yeah. is it. This is it. And, and again, going fast forward into now with this new album, the fact we're still here and we've come up with the goods and we've written a great set of songs. It's just lovely now as a 51 year old man to kind of think, well, yeah, we have chose the right way we wanted to go. We've done it all our own way. However yeah. cool some people might think yeah. we are. This is us. Been vindicated. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Totally. Yeah. 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 So right, before... you still, um, oh, you still, uh, obviously still getting a buzz out of playing live. The band's been back together for, for a while now. You still, still yeah. enjoying playing live all, and all that. Just love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. Love it. I think in the nineties, I'd be a bit more kind of, I don't know, um, a bit more cautious and worried about the gig going well. So I'd be getting really nervous beforehand. And then if somebody made a mistake on stage, I'd be giving them evils. Why have you done that? Why didn't, why, why have you cocked up? Whereas now yeah. I embrace all of that. I absolutely yeah. 
I yeah, adore it. Really. So it's, I mean, what could be better than walking out onto a stage in front of 4,000 people who are just waiting to, for you to come out? Yeah. And then it's just seeing a sea of faces, seeing every word back at you. I mean, yeah, and already yeah. I, can t- I can tell with this new album, when we go out and play it, the, the buzz on social media for it and the love that we seem to be oh, getting. It's a belter, man. It's great. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? But the fact that people are all confused on which is their favourite song, it's not like everyone's zoning in on one song. and uh, Every it's song is be a good sign, mentioned. yeah. Oh, it's, it's going to be amazing playing these Brilliant, new songs. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 All right, um, before we go, before you go, and we ask every, every band member we interview the same question, basically. Um, which other band from... From from the night from that era in the nineties, would you have liked to have been in, and why? If you weren't in Shed Seven, oh, um, well, that's a good question. Um, so, are you talking nineties through to noughties, or does it have to? Any time is okay. Any time yeah. is fine. Yeah. Any time is fine. Well, yeah. Uh, can I say? Can I say the Pixies then? Ooh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Any particular reason? That would. Well, because I remember discovering the Pixies just after I was leaving school, I think when Surfer Rosa came out and hearing that and thinking, what the hell is that? But it's absolutely amazing, which made me buy the first album, Come On Pilgrim, which I preferred. And then when they came out with uh, Doolittle, I'm just thinking, that wow. I mean, they were so groundbreaking, that band, and Nirvana wouldn't have happened without them, um, which yeah, Kurt Cobain yeah. admitted. Um, just the crazy rhythms the shouting the great lyrics the cool female bass player so yeah i would love yeah, to yeah. be in the pixies thanks brilliant answer. Great answer. brilliant um all right and um, what's the best way for people to kind of find out what you're up to your, your social media this week has been a joy to follow by the way uh, what's the well, best way for them you, to, to catch up i guess if you leave your front door turn left go down to the roundabout turn right <laughs> at the same and follow your nose you'll find out everything you need to know <laughs> Got Perfect. it. Got it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Really appreciate the time. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me yeah, on. Yeah. And, uh, Cheers, Rick. No, no, no. Out. Let me know when it's going out and I'll share the love. Yeah. Rick Witter. What a legend. When we did that interview, they were number one and they he came on and chatted to us for 20 minutes, which just, you know. Appreciate that. So why could he only do 20 minutes? Well, Dave, when you've got a number one album, you have to do a lot of press and stuff. So he sandwiched us in between Radio 1 and Rolling Stone magazine. He just made that up. He did, he did. It's well, it true. might have been. It might have been. That's true. That's true. At first I was like, oh, we didn't really get our, you know, get our teeth into it like we often do. But at the same time, well, but I think we did enough. And also it kind of made made me feel a bit more like, you know, a bit more legitimate, like proper, proper media being, uh, you know, part of the, the interview cycle. So Yeah, we had cool. our slot. We had our 20 minutes. Would have been nice to speak for longer, but maybe next time, you know. Yeah. Welcome yeah. back on yeah. at any time. Yeah. Yeah, what a great guy, and what a week for Shed Seven. Um, don't know if anyone saw that coming. And it couldn't have happened to to nicer guys, right? They, if anyone deserves that kind of, uh, you know, final acclaim, this is them. You know, have you listened to the new album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. I, I really like the it. the last song on it, the one with Pete Doherty, Throwaways. That mm. seems to be about this situation. About the idea of they're, they're kind of, you know, cast off and not seen as, you know, relevant. And uh, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter, you know. That seems to yeah. be what that that's about. It's, I don't know, maybe I'm mis, mis, misreading it. But. No, no, yeah, it could be right. I, it kind of sounds, sounds to me like he never really gave a shit about any of that. It, they just did what they did. And it didn't upset them too much that they sort of didn't get the front of enemy and all that sort of thing. If anything, it gave them a bit of longevity, right? Perseverance, isn't it? Just keep going and you never know what's going to happen the stars might align for you at some point which is what happens and yeah and well it's it's well we talked about it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago but it's just a really good album and like he said yeah. at the end like yeah, you um, still got after the, you still got after the material right yeah like he was saying like you know there's different different people are saying each you know almost every track is someone's favorite track and i think that's definitely true right it's it's very varied and um but it, all the tracks are just really good you know that's the thing, like, you can have a little bit of luck, but without having the songs, it doesn't matter. You've got to have a bit of both. Dave is a diehard Shedhead. What's your verdict? Yeah, come on, Shedhead. <laughs> You're sitting there all quiet. Yeah, I yeah, I enjoyed the interview. 
I made a mistake. I've made too many notes. You're a super fan, a fanboy. Yeah. Shithead. It's understandable. One thing, you know, he was talking about going to the pub with his dad. I feel like I've missed out on going to the pub with my dad. But you can only fit your dad in the oh, pub mate. on his own because <laughs> of his <laughs> massive head. His head. Second biggest head in the RAF. Yeah, but it's not wider than a pub door. <laughs> True. Like that character. Where was that character from the 90s with a massive head? That my paper mache head. Yeah. Are we talking about um, Frank Sidebottom? Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So your dad looks like him. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> But that was a nice story, like, when he was talking about his dad and stuff. That was really nice, though. I love that sort of shit, that, the power of music, isn't it? Like, it's a real privilege if you're in a band that when people listen to your songs, to be able to write songs that relate to someone you love. It's a pretty cool thing to have, right? And it sounds like his dad was a big fan of the band, so it's a fitting sort of tribute, which is really nice. Can I have a quick way? Go on. Don't have a shit when you're in there, though. Sometimes they come out by mistake, don't they? Don't shit on your dick. What? <laughs> Wait, don't. Don't, sh- don't shit on your dick, Dave. Do you remember a band called um, Penthouse in the 90s? There's a band called Penthouse. They had um, they had a lyric that said, uh, if only, wait, wait, let me get this right. If only your dick was as big as your shit. That was the line. I've always loved that. There he is. I don't know if our listeners will be interested, but I do have an energy-saving tip. Use the cold tap. Pardon? Use the cold tap when you wash your hands. Don't use the hot tap. But that's what people do anyway. What are you talking about? Is it? I always used to use the hot is. tap, but there's never time for it to get hot, so I've just wasted a load of hot water. But that's just you being... And I've never used a hot tap. You just burn your hand. Oh. All right. <laughs> England's the only country in the world that still has separated hot and cold taps. What the fuck? It's like they're not the... Not the 19th century where you have separate... No no countries have separate hot and cold taps anymore. A robot comes and fucking washes your nuts over there, doesn't it? Is that what it does if you want it to. Dave, what else you pick up on? Yeah, come on, Shedhead. No, the one, the one interesting thing was talking about how the record company was forcing them to do... Oh, a, uh, Polydor. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Forcing them to do a greatest hits album. And they said, right, do us two, two hit songs. That's right, just go and write two hit songs. Yeah, then he said, oh, you can't do that. You know, that's not how it works. But then he revealed the two songs. <laughs> yeah. They, and they were they, good. They, they were great <laughs> like songs. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think in general, you can't just go, oh, can you just go and write a hit song for us? Yeah, yeah, all right, no problem. I'll be back in an hour. It doesn't work like that, does it? Because it's, it's, it's in the listener. The listener decides if it's a hit or not. But, yeah, that's he true. Just had, yeah, yeah, that... Yeah, that's but a good did, point. He did go out and write two hits. So. Yeah. But I think sometimes, you know, a bit of pressure can force out, you know, a good bit of creativity. I think most of the songs they wrote was hits, though, right? I, they didn't really write one that wasn't. Also, I've read a couple of interviews where they're they talking about like, how they wrote songs really quickly. Um, I, th- mm. I saw um, a tweet, I think, from a couple of years ago. They wrote Bully Boy in five minutes in a hotel room in Tokyo. They wrote Chasing Rainbows in like 20 minutes and in the tour bus. Um, just yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. Actually, yeah. you know, just a note for future interviews. I would like you to ask a bit more about the songwriting process. All right. Fucking hell. All right. I? That's a good idea. You know, I'm a, I'm a very amateur songwriter over the, you know, in my life. Oh, I don't on, not really know. There, what Dave? songs have you written? What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't share them. <laughs> I've heard they don't some exist. songs. No, no, no I've heard really? some. They're all right. Yeah, they're all right. He wrote a song. T- sing us that Londoner's song. No, I'm not going to do that. Go on then, Dave. Go on. So you're an, am- you're an amateur songwriter. Yeah. Yeah, Go the on. thing I would really like to ask someone like Rick Witter, and it's too late now, how do you put the ideas together? You know, it's one thing to write Lots of little bits, like a verse and a chorus. But how do you fit them together? You know, I was reading. I was reading an interview with him talking about the songwriting process, actually, and he says that you know he gets like the melody in his head, and once he's got that, it basically comes together. Yeah, that's how I used to write. You don't, why are you? Why are both of you claiming to be fucking songwriters? We are. It's just, it's fucking come out band. of nowhere. I was in a band. You said it was a good song in the Facebook group. 
Yeah, but you didn't I write wrote it. I wrote that. I did. Fuck off. I co-wrote that. How much? What did you contribute to that? That particular song, not much, but yeah. me and Vince I didn't enjoy that, though. It's a song. good song. It's a good song. But I think every band writes, writes differently. So, yeah, it would be an interesting question to ask. Maybe we should get more into that. Um, we will, Dave. We will. Feedback noted. Yeah. Some bands write together. Some some bands like Oasis, Noel just writes it and says, there you go, there's a song. And which, in their case, works better because as soon as he started saying, oh, you can have one, you can have one, was when they went shit. But it's interesting, going back to what you were saying about the, you know, being forced to write a greatest hits album and writing the hits. But I think that really showed, you know, his in integrity, basically, not mm. wanting to rip off the fans. Um, I, I thought that was really yeah. cool. They basically said, I'll re-release that one because it did quite well. And he's like, well, yeah, they've already bought that one. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's again, again, what we've spoken about a lot with people from that period. You know, back then, it was all done via a record company. You didn't, you couldn't do it yourself. So you just had to kind of play, play ball a little bit or, or tell them to fuck off, I guess. One of the two. Mm. I'd one more little, um, little thought from the interview. Oh, come on, shared head. Tell us. You know, he was talking about jur- the journalists and how he, they had a bit of a bad rap from enemy melody maker. What happened to them? Well, most 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 magazines folded, didn't they? Basically, when 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 the internet came along, and Enemy still exists. So basically, it went it went free for a while. Uh, first, mm. well, first, we went online only. Then it went free, and they were like handing them out in like stations in London and stuff. And I then it went again back online. And now I think it's it's there is a print edition now that's not free. I think uh, right at the moment, but these days they just write. I, I I follow them on like Facebook and stuff. These these days they just write about K-pop and stuff like that. It's mm, not like yeah. the kind of indie stuff that they wrote about um, in the nineties, which is fair, right? Is you know times move on. It's what young people listen to, so it's still go. Enemy is still there in some form, but Melody Maker isn't. Yeah, this leads me on to another point. Um, talking to Rick about how he got how the band come together and all that sort of thing, and he he's, he said he'd like. He, he used to enjoy being an indie kid, like because it was his sort of scene, and then it all became mainstream, and it was a bit mm. like, oh, in a way, it was a bit rubbish because he liked the whole being part of something, yeah, indie, yeah, you know. In the nineties, it all went mad, didn't it? So the indie became the mainstream, which uh, hasn't really happened since, I guess. No, but it was a crazy time, right? I mean, it's it's unusual for that kind of thing to happen, you know. And I, I found it quite interesting that he was talking about how they were kind of the outsiders and they didn't make the move to London like all the other bands. They still stayed in York and they were kind of still on the, the fringes of the Britpop scene. Yeah, I read a, I read an interview and he said, you know, they didn't even th- consider for a second, like, you know, moving moving down to London or, or leaving York mm. or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Again, it just shows they they had their priorities right and their integrity intact, you know. But that would explain, like, the press and stuff, giving them a rub- bad time because they didn't play their game sort of thing, I guess. Although, you know, they were on top of the pops a shitload of times and mm. all of that. Although I read something, I don't know if it's true, that said uh, every time they appeared on top of the pops, their, the single that they were promoting went down in the charts the next week. <laughs> oh, really? That's interesting. <laughs> That's what it claimed. Oh, what does that mean? Though? That's what it said. Neil, you're holding that mug as if you want people to see it. What are you advertising? No, no, I haven't. I see. I'm not ah, totally it's, just, on. It, it's just a normal mug. But like you said, like you said, just going back to that a little bit about being you know, um, an indie, an indie, an indie kid. I like the the little story about uh, painting the Soup Dragons logo onto his denim jacket. You can yeah, really like kind of visualise that, and you know, going to school with that painted on your jacket. That that was cool. I like that a lot. This has happened a few times on the podcast now, where we've kind of. Slag something off and then a band sort of said, oh, I really like that. His love of the late Smiths. I think, like, I don't not like the Smiths. I think, like, there's a couple of songs that I think are really good, but that's it. That's as far as I go with them. I like Morrissey. I don't know what the... What the but you're... <laughs> well, you're a fellow racist, though. So you too are like birds of <laughs> a feather. Yeah, you live in, like, a, one of the most conservative <laughs> towns in Britain. 
<laughs> so you're bound to like Morrissey. I don't know anything about what he's supposed to have done. I just like his music. Are you voting reform this year? No. Are you voting EDL? <laughs> There's no candidate here. <laughs> Otherwise, you would be. You can stand, man. He's got a massive Tommy Robinson poster on his wall at home. Uh, I think I think Morrissey has. I think he has shown support for EDL in the past. Just so we're clear, Dave isn't. <laughs> he's not. He's not. At he's all not a massive friend. racist, but Morrissey is. <laughs> yeah. I listened to that. Um, this is our out by the Soup Dragons. It it was quite ahead of its time. The sound, nineteen eighty eight. It was. Mm. That's it what he said. Sound isn't it? like nineteen eighty eight at all. Mm. Yeah, that's what he said. He said it doesn't really sound like Soup Dragons, does it? It's, it's, it's like no. before they became all commercial and stuff. Yeah, I'd listened to a couple of tracks as well. Yeah, it's good. I I like, and we've heard this a lot with bands that are still going from the nineties. Seems like in a way they enjoy it more now than they did then because then it was all trying to get one up on each other and success and all that sort of thing and now it's just they still play to big crowds but it, there's no pressure so the pressure's off and they can just enjoy themselves and I like I like that when I went to the Shine On festival so, you know the, the crowds are huge but they, these bands have nothing to prove anymore they're, they're, the audience is already there it must be a really nice nice position to be in I think yeah, also I think they've got a lot more control. Um, most of them have kind of come off of the, the major labels and they're doing stuff on their own. They're, like Rick said, they're managing themselves. They're on cooking vinyl, but that's uh, kind of, uh, you know, a nice kind of smaller um, uh, record company. And I think, yeah, you know. Did you see uh, a put posted in the face? I shared one of um, Smash's Ed's posting some more records out this week it looked like i i bought i, I bought one <laughs> there, there you go oh, i he, bought he, a seven he, I, bet he's, I bet he's really glad that he's got got to send another one to fucking japan well no you see i didn't i didn't want him to lose out money again so i i had it sent to my mum's house and i'll pick it up when i go over so i didn't want it i didn't want to cause him any trouble again but yeah i, I bought a copy of the uh this heaven 15 yeah. uh, seven inch yeah yeah, no, I love all that. Yeah, they're all, yeah, just doing it all themselves now, aren't they? Which is great. Um, like I say, there's no pressure. They haven't got anything to prove. And I've, I've kind of said it at the end of the interview, but I, I've, I've kind of like, because I knew we were going to be interviewing them. I've been following like their, I followed like their social media for the whole of the week when they were number one. And it was, mm. it was a total joy. They were loving it, you know, all like yeah, videos yeah, yeah. of them. There was a video of them at Resident Records in Brighton, which is really yeah, cool. I saw that, yeah. And they just seemed to just be really enjoying the moment. And it was it was a beautiful thing, you know. It's great. I guess when you're in a band that's been together that long with, with a with a diehard fan base, like, you know, shed heads like Dave. Yeah. Then uh, when something like that happens, everyone's in it together, aren't they? So it's, it's, it's a number one album for all of them, the fans as well. And it's, that's a, it's just a really nice thing. Yeah, yeah, it's great. That's great. The way I see it, like Shed Seven, at the time, you, they kind of, maybe, but they weren't in everyone's faces like the other bands. But they had fifteen top forty hits. They're just sort of in the back, stealth, like having hit after hit after hit. You know, they weren't. It's not like they didn't do anything, is it? They say they were like yeah. the championships in the Championship League of Britpop, but. I don't know. I definitely wouldn't say uh, that. I reckon they're Premier League. Well, here you go. Speaking mm. of speaking of this this analogy, I found a quote from um, Llewellyn Smith in the um, Sunday Telegraph, and this is this was back in the day, and he described them as uh, for, forever the Leicester City of Britpop. Ah, that's a good mm-hmm. one. Well, this was before Leicester City won won the uh, the Premier League, you know, against the odds five thousand to one. Unbeknownst to him, it was a pretty good analogy because, uh, yeah, mm. there you go. Yeah, it works. Good one. On that note, that's it for this one. Like Luke said, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome. If you're watching, please do like, subscribe, leave us a comment below. Let us know your favourite Shed 7 songs, your Shed 7 memories. If you're listening, rate, review, really helps other people find the podcast. But not just if you're new, but anyone, please do share this podcast with your mates so we can get, get some of those on board too. The more the merrier. Luke, have you got the mixtape sorted for this week? 
it's nearly ready. Yeah, it's very, it's very Shed 7 heavy, which sounds strange, but they've just got so many songs. It's, I couldn't decide what to leave out. So um, usually I do like half of the band or whatever and half other stuff, but it's, it's pretty much nearly all Shed 7 at the moment. So um, yeah, that's their fault for having so many uh, amazing songs, mm. you know? Can you stick Stand By on it for me? I'll make a note. Are we going to do a wang next week? Yeah, so it should have been this week, but it, it got um, bumped due to uh, our, our last minute uh, interview with Rick. So. And yeah, just uh, really grateful for, to, to Rick for his time. Yeah. We appreciate it. it was a busy week and he still squeezed us in. So big respect to Rick. That's it for this one. And um, Dave? See you in a minute.